Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this e-bike info session. We're so happy to have this uh, wonderful array of guests with us tonight. We have Galen Mook, the Executive Director of Mass Bikes. We have Omar Kadari, uh, as you may have heard, an e-bike owner for three years, a uh, member of the Lexington Bike Advisory Committee, and we hear he is part owner of a new bike shop opening up in East Lexington sometime this month. And we have Christina Burwell, who you may be familiar with as the Executive Director of the Monroe Arts Center, but she is also a new and very enthusiastic e-bike owner. So we're happy to have her aboard as well. Throughout this session, um, feel free to um, send something in the chat. I will keep my eyes on that. And um, you can also raise your hand and we'll make sure that there's time at the end um, for Q&A. And again, just a reminder that this is being recorded on Lex Media. And now I'm actually gonna hand it over to Omar. Take it away, Omar. Okay, um, I'm sort of sorry we can't hear other people talk because it would be nice to, to, um, to like take a poll and see like who's tried e-bikes or, or whatnot. But anyway, it's not possible. So let me just jump right into um, sharing my screen. Second. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's an e-bike? It's a regular bike with some extra features. Can you see my cursor when I do this? Yep. Okay, so this is a battery on this bike. Uh, this is where the motor is on this bike. On some e-bikes, the motor is located in the rear hub, some e-bikes it's located here in the middle, some it is on the front hub, and some have batteries in different places too, like the down tube or the seat tube. Um, but the battery and a motor are, are sort of two key elements. Um, another extra element that e-bikes have are some kind of controls, usually, for you to be able to turn them on and off, set the speed that you want to go at and, and uh, usually be able to see a speedometer or, um, or something like that. Lots of e-bikes also have built-in lights, which is nice. Since they have batteries, um, it sort of makes sense to uh, have lights built in. This one has one in the front and the back. This e-bike is, a, I think it's a Gazelle Arroyo. And, and I think that because I have a Gazelle Arroyo and it looks very similar to this. Um, what else did I want to say? So, okay, pedal assist versus hand throttle. Some e-bikes also have a throttle that you can control with your hand and that will make it go, kind of like a motorcycle. But almost all e-bikes have pedal assist. Actually, there are some, some e-bikes that don't have pedal assist. And what pedal assist is, is that as you, as you turn your feet on the pedals, as you crank the pedals, the motor kicks in, regardless of whether the motor is here or in the back or in the front, it'll kick in when you're pedaling and start to assist you as you pedal. So it, it, adds, some, it adds some energy. So I'm going to uh, just jump in um, yeah. For a minute, because before I did this, I had I had no idea what an, an e bike was really. I just thought it had a motor and it went. And so I had all these apprehensions about how you control that. Um, and I realized that if I'm not pedaling, the motor isn't going. I also I'm not a motorbike user, so I had no idea what a throttle was. <clears throat> and I realized that the throttle is that at least on my bike, it's that little lever that if you need the oomph to get up the hill, you just press that and then it gives the oomph. And that's regardless of whether you're pedaling or not. You call it a throttle, I call it an oomph. Okay, okay. Not all e-bikes have that oomph. Mine doesn't. It, it, the only way to get the motor to help you is to pedal on my bike. But, um, and I think Galen is gonna talk to us a little bit later about the different categories of e-bikes because some categories might have a throttle or might not, some, some don't. But um, yeah, there are a lot of different kinds of e-bikes. I was gonna mention the 
power, but maybe I'll go to the next slide. Hang on. Uh, Built-in lights. Oh, sensors. So um, most e-bikes have sensors that tell how fast you're pedaling, and they uh, use that information to control the motor. Um, the more you want, you're pedaling, the more oomph it gives you. Um, some e-bikes also have a torque sensor, which measures how hard you're pressing the pedals, not how fast you're pressing the pedals. And um, that's sort of like an extra feature that, that, uh, that happens on more expensive models. And the reason is it, it's, um, it's more equipment, it's more sensors, it's more sort of computer uh, uh, computing required, but um, it can create a very natural sort of feeling effect as you, as you push your feet on the pedals, the harder you push, the harder the motor helps you. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is the grin on this lady's face. Christina, can you? <laughs> I giggle when I ride my bike now. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, I've got a little bell now, so that helps. Um, so, you know, people say that you have to find joy in your life. And, you know, you get to this age and you think, well, what is joy? What do I find fun? Like really fun. Um, you know, you'd like to have a, a glass of wine on the porch, which is nice, but it's not fun. And I got to say, riding my bike has been fun like the wind does not thwart me and i've ridden every day this week which wasn't a particularly nice week and many days i looked like i was going to my lobster boat instead of work but um so you ride your bike to work christina i ride my bike to work it takes me nine minutes by car and it takes no it takes me six minutes by car and it takes me nine minutes on my bike so i there's just no reason not to take my bike you dress well and it's fine. And it's, I gotta say it's fun. Like I'm not, I have a very low threshold for discomfort and um, there's nothing. The, the, the hills don't bother me. The wind doesn't bother me. It's fun. I'm with you, Christina. I, I have the exact same feeling. I'm glad you mentioned clothing. I wanna get to clothing maybe in the tip section later. So let me try and remember to talk about that because um, uh, to, me, to me, clothing is, is key. I wanted to move on to talk about power. This particular bike, as I said, is a Gazelle Arroyo. It's a 250 watt motor, this motor down here. Um, 250 watts is a third of a horsepower. And it is pretty common for e-bikes in Europe because anything above 200, and this bike, by the way, is made in the Netherlands. It's made by um, Gazelle, which is a Dutch company. Um, in Europe, if the bike does not have a hand throttle, it's only pedal assist, and it's 250 watts or less, there are no regulations. It's basically regulated exactly as if it were a conventional bike. It can go where conventional bikes go. It can park where conventional bikes park. Uh, it is, for, for legal purposes, just the conventional bike. So the vast majority of bikes in Europe, e-bikes in Europe, are, are about that amount of power. I'm gonna change the slide to talk about power. One horsepower is 750 watts. This is a picture of a, of a horse actually helping out with, uh, with the bike. And uh, in the US, Galen, help me out here. In the US, 750 watts is the maximum that you can have and still call it an e-bike, isn't that right? Yeah, it's up to 750 is a federal guideline based federal on guideline. consumer protection. Um, and what, 30 something other states have defined, but not Massachusetts. So I'll get into that when we get into it. And it'll right. later. But yeah, right. standard is 750 um, for manufacturers for the most part. I think even in Massachusetts, um, the federal government has some guidelines about what you can call an e-bike. 
it's not about where you can use it or how you regulate it or anything like that, but it's about selling it. Isn't that right, Galen, or not? Yeah, it's, it's the consumer protection law that we have um, right now. What we're trying to work on, which I'll get to shortly in the presentation, is uh, defining this in Massachusetts so then we could regulate where they can and can't be ridden. But right now, you can go and buy, based on the consumer protection law, a e-bike up to 750 watts. Although, mm -hmm. to Omar's point, most are well under that. Um, and the point of having the wattage as a limit, it, it's a way of limiting the size of the machine. So you can have a lighter bike with uh, wattage, which could make it go faster. So the way that we limit e-bikes in terms of speed, miles per hour, as well as in terms of wattage, which de facto is a limit on the weight. That's how we got around saying like, well, you couldn't have like a 700 pound bicycle um, with a, you know, multiple thousand watt engine that only goes 20 miles an hour. But if it's, if it's that, then we're not trying to make that an e-bike because that would just mm -hmm. kind of be another device altogether. So the wattage is important because it also limits the, uh, the, the size of the bicycle. And you can think of this as important when you're thinking of cargo bikes versus um, standard pedal bikes, um, tag along bikes tandems, uh, the various sizes add to different weights. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of 750 watt e-bikes, but I've seen a lot of 500 watt e-bikes. And my first e-bike was a 500 watt e-bike. And that was pretty peppy. Um, really went uphill like, you know, you hardly had to try. So anyway, um, I think you will find 250 watts, very common, 300 watts sometimes. Uh, uh, 500 watts is a common uh, amount of power. 750 is the is the limit. Um, this is a picture of William Shatner and his wife on their Pedigo e-bikes. My first e-bike was a Pedigo. I actually saw all their marketing. They had they had an early lead in the U.S. in e-bike manufacturing, which I think is gone now. Um, but um, yeah, their their uh, motto is hello fun. So um, that is, that's how they position themselves. They, they don't try and get people to commute or, or do anything else. It's to, to Pedigo, it's all about fun. Their bikes are very, very beefy. I think I heard a rumor that the, the two guys who founded the company are really big guys and uh, they like making extremely sturdy bikes. Um, so as you can see, William Shatner and his wife both have the e-bike grin. Um, going up hills is easy, right, Christina? That's part of the fun. It is. Going downhill's fun too. You know, it's probably, <laughs> for, me it's, for me, it's really the same speed because, um, <laughs> You, you, can, you can pace that a little bit. I find that I have regular cyclists who are going faster than I am. So I'm not, um, I'm not big on the speed. I, mm. think, I think I go like between 15 and at most 19 miles an hour. I don't know what normal is, but which is faster than a regular bike for sure. Like I noticed faster the than me on a regular bike. Yeah, I noticed the potholes in a way that I never noticed the potholes on a regular bike. Can I interject something? Yes. So I am not an e-bike owner, but I have ridden one um, only in the version of the line bikes that we used to have in the community. Mm -hmm. And the first time I tried it, I was terrified because I thought when I heard electric bike, I thought, oh no, it's just gonna like take off, you know, and I, and I, yeah, I all so that too. power behind me. And those are pedal assist. And I realized it, it wasn't scary at all. I just put my pedals on and it just made it easier. And yes, getting up those hills was, was definitely a lot easier. So that, that's all I have to add. <laughs> I think no. one of the things that I was concerned about is um, not how fast you go, but how well you can stop, right? And and that's one of the things that I was pleasantly surprised about because you have total control. It's like any regular bike. You know, you stop pedaling, the motor stops. You put your hand on the brake, the bike stops. So. Yeah, um, actually a lot of e-bikes have pretty darn good brakes. A lot of them come equipped with um, hydraulic brakes, which are much easier to, 
to stop with. You know, it takes very little hand force. And, I, you know, I highly recommend hydraulic brakes. I think they're, they're really great, especially on an e-bike, because you are going faster than you're used to going on a bike. And you do want to be able to stop. Um, so um, not all e-bikes have hydraulic brakes, however. The, these two bikes here are converted con conventional bikes. They have the Copenhagen wheel, um, that red giant hub on the back. It's an integrated battery and motor and computer. Um, I don't even know how it works. I think they're about, I think they're 300 watt. It's a 300 watt motor. Um, and I think, it's a Massachusetts company. Um, could be wrong about that. But I know they have an office somewhere around here. Yeah, it was a project out of, sorry to interrupt, it was a project out of MIT's Media Lab, I think, mm. that kind of spurred this. And then they, um, they call themselves super pedestrian as their right. um, branding. You can look them up. But I think they're, to be honest, this is a whole other presentation, but they might be getting into the scooter space these days uh, oh. uh, but I know we're not even going to touch that today so right, right. I'll, I'll leave it at that right so um, this is an example of converting a conventional bike to an e-bike which is also something that you can do um, I have read that you have to be very careful about that um, because a lot of regular bikes really aren't designed to go 20 miles an hour and you know, uh, some conversions. Actually, the I saw a guy on a conversion who did have a 750 watt motor and he, he could go pretty darn fast on his bike, but it was a conversion. Again, most e-bikes that are designed as e-bikes are designed with very, very beefy components because nobody really cares about the weight or as you don't care as much about the weight as you do on a conventional bike. And even down to things like the spokes of the wheels are a little bit thicker than you would find on a similar conventional bike. And all the, the metal parts, the, I don't know what they're all called, but um, bikes do take a greater beating when you ride them faster. And um, so you do need to just be aware of that and know what you're doing if you're going to do a conversion. Um, and again, the brakes, for example, you want to make sure you have darn good brakes. Yeah, I might, I might caution you here, Omar. So uh, sorry to jump in, but I, sure. I did work five years before this in the advocacy world. I was in the, in the bike industry world. And one of the challenges that we face, especially in the e-bike sphere, is the low-end box store bikes mm. um, that are purchased from Walmart or Target or Costco, which are not built by a professional bike builder. They're built by whomever is the lowest wage employee. Um, and, you know, it, we, we cringe a little bit sometimes when you see somebody bring a bike into a bike store when the fork is reversed or the brakes are put on backwards um, or something very obvious is, is happening. So if you are ever going to convert a bike or think even about purchasing a bike, even from a box store, I don't want to dissuade anybody from buying a lower end bike because I think price ranges vary and that's fine, but make sure it's checked out by a professional mechanic um, who can do the test because what we would hate to have happen is you try to convert a very low end bike that has componentry that is not suited for the, the weight, the speed and the torque that comes with electric conversion. And that's why folks like Omar are starting a bike shop so that you can have kind of a professional backing to this. Um, Cause we, we are in this kind of gray area where you can purchase a low end bike um, and then you can purchase a converted kit and then you can kind of combine one and two and it might not actually be safe. So it's, in my opinion, very important to remind folks that, um, you know, professional mechanics exist for a reason. So I'll, I'll step back, but thanks for letting me jump in. Well, no problem, Galen. Thank you so much for making that pitch and doing my bidding. The check will be in the mail, you know, for, <laughs> for plugging. We're not getting paid for this, don't worry. This is, uh, <laughs> Um, okay, uh, I wanted to talk about pros and cons of e-bikes versus conventional bikes. Um, 
Christina, you and I talked about this, about the cargo carrying capacity. This is a picture. Well, you know, I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump in sure. even before that, because I felt that when it was recommended to me to check out an e-bike, that it was an extravagance. Um, and so for me, the con was that it was, it cost more and I, I should just make do with my bike that I bartered for that um, was hard to get up the hills and, and I should be satisfied and fine with that. And that's what I should get to work. And that's what I had been getting to work. And so I think I've overcome that con because it is, I feel like I'm doing something not only good for the environment, but I, I, I am, you know, saving costs with, fuel and the smells along the route to work in the summertime are wonderful. But I think it was a con for me just to get over the hurdle of the expense, which is not that it's that much. It doesn't have to be that much, but that was something I had to push past just psychologically. It is an issue. The, the, the e-bikes are more expensive than regular bikes. So yeah. Um, what I was uh, hoping to say about this picture, it's a picture of uh, uh, a young woman somewhere in Europe with uh, her Orglebe pannier over her shoulder, which I found to be a ubiquitous sight. Everywhere in Europe, you see young people with their Orglebe panniers. They, they, they detach from the bike or they attach back to the bike. And they they um, are carried everywhere and seen everywhere. Um, they're very useful. They're a great idea for any bike, but for an e-bike, it's a no-brainer because you know you can carry stuff, and it doesn't um, it doesn't feel like it's weighing you down because you've got the help um, pedaling, even if you've got bags full of groceries on the back of your bike. So, um, trick question here, what's wrong with this picture? It is obviously somewhere in Europe. Christina, Galen, Susan, the others can't speak. What's wrong with this picture? She's got a helmet. Nobody has a helmet in Europe. Oh, that was a trick question. I'm, I got to I got to say we we are we are full helmet supporters at Mass Bike so yes, um, yes you know when you're overseas that's up to you but yeah um, it was I, the I, I, know, I know that you will include helmets on all your test rides almost. absolutely absolutely a big well, helmet you, supporter I, hopefully this generation feels the same way but it's kind of like you feel naked if you don't have one on a bike you know the same way that you wouldn't consider wearing a, not having a seatbelt in a car yeah yeah. So this is a cargo bike. It's a turn, I believe. Um, it's a cargo e-bike. Not all cargo bikes are electrified, but this one is. It's another picture. This one is in Amsterdam, actually. That's why the guy's not wearing a helmet. Um, but um, as you can see, it has a sort of extra large uh, cargo rack on the back. So not only can he carry really big panniers, but um, uh, a bunch of more stuff besides. Cargo bikes are becoming extremely popular and they're, they're very useful. It's the, for the same reason that SUVs are so popular in the US. Um, you can just carry more stuff. This is another type of cargo bike. This one is a... Yuba, Yuba Supermarché. And this uh, mom has a child seat on the back, a cargo box in the front with the dog and the, and the luggage. Um, this picture reminded me of the film Motherload, which I haven't seen and I'm dying to see, see if anybody has a chance to see it. It's a very interesting documentary film about the trend of moms on cargo bikes. This is a, again, an e-bike. You know, I, I had 18 by 24 sheets of corrugated plastic on the back of my bike coming home. I felt proud about that. Wow. 
that's nothing by comparison. I want to see that. I want to see you riding with your... Good bungee cord. <laughs> so, um, Christina, you mentioned saving fuel. Uh, I have some stats on this, and I um, can't remember where I got these, but a regular bike, of course, is free. Um, and someone even once told me that even the energy that humans, uh, like the food that you eat, is free because of what's called the calorie paradox. Have you heard of this, Galen? That um, as you exercise, you become more fit and your, your body burns more efficiently. So um, the, you, you aren't just, you aren't costing more. You're not eating more food to get yourself around on a bike. If I can um, add to that too, Omar, the, the benefits, the health benefits of preventative exercise um, far outweigh, you know, the, the necessity of, you know, high blood pressure or something much more detrimental down the line. And I think we all agree that we spend a lot of time in sedentary positions these days that the e enormous benefits of just getting out and pedaling, um, if it's a low stress environment, by gosh, like that pays far dividends to society as a whole, just by keeping people healthy. Um, and hard absolutely. to quantify because we don't have a system of American healthcare that really values that like it necessarily should, but you should know that if you get out and get some cardio every single day, you are going to save yourself. I mean, not just your life, but you will save yourself a ton of money down the line. So I, I was there. surprised. I was surprised a little bit about that too, because I do feel that I am getting cardio on my e-bike, which isn't something that you would expect that you change, at least on my bike, you could, you press a lever to have the amount of pedal assist that you have going. And so I feel that I am pushing as hard as I want to push and, and I am getting a workout. I mean, I can feel my heart as though it's really pumping. Mm -hmm. Well, you need the I, core strength to stay balanced at the very least. <laughs> um, otherwise you just tip right over. So there is, there is, lot of muscles and, and all that going on. And it's, it's good adrenaline. Um, it's good blood flow. It's good stress when you're out there biking on a bike path in the woods. I agree with Christina. I, I feel like I get exercise as well on my e-bike. And it's kind of this weird, um, what's the word? Um, I can't think of the word. Irony? Maybe not. Um, the the fact that it's fun and, and seems easy and seems fun. You feel like, you know, yes. like superhuman. At, well, I was going to say superhuman as you, as you're pedaling and that gives you a big grin and you feel fun. Um, you would think that you would not be um, getting a lot of exercise, but there's this weird psychological phenomenon that as I am pedaling the pedals, I, I sort of automatically, um, I automatically exert a certain amount of energy. You just can't, you just can't like spin your feet without, without any trying. You have to push a little bit and being asked to push even a little bit makes you push at a, at a sort of at a comfortable rate for you to be pushing. And that comfortable rate is enough to give you um, quite a bit of exercise. So, um, but back to, back to, how great this is for your carbon footprint. E-bikes, so fuel cost, I think is, is a good proxy for carbon footprint because um, you can't compare apples to apples with every type of vehicle and every type of transportation, but, but you can compare dollars of, of fuel cost and that will, will roughly equate to how much um, uh, fossil fuels you're, you're using. Electric cars, 3.3 cents per mile, and e-bikes, less than 0 0.2 cents. So, you, so if you right now are feeling so virtuous because you're driving around Lexington in your Tesla, imagine how you would feel driving around Lexington on your e-bike because you'll be way holier than thou then. And this is a, this is a good car. Car, a high high mileage car, six point two cents per mile. 
buses, ouch. You would think buses would compare really favorably with cars, but this is per passenger mile. And apparently buses go around with very few passengers on average. And uh, the, um, the average per passenger mile is 9.5 cents. So it doesn't even compare very well with a, with a good mileage car. Do you have the to add a little thing in there, Omar, just to catch up? Uh, this is not an anti-bus session. Um, no, true. Everybody should be out there walking, biking, and if you can't and busing. take a bus, it's a much better option than hopping Sorry about a that. car. It's also better for cyclists because the less cars on the road, the more comfortable it's going to be for the cyclists. So just got to make that little interjection okay. there. Okay. And you know, I took the bus, um, I've been 25 years and I took the bus for the first time. Darn, it was convenient. Mm -hmm. It really was. Oh, I have, I have teenagers now, so I, I find myself on these modes of transportation. Anyway, these are not my stats. I can't remember where I got them. Average automobile, 13 cents, obviously bad. Taxi Uber, 33 cents a mile. Look how that compares. Really bad, because they drive around empty. They drive around, you know, not, not taking passengers all the time. So e-bikes, really good for your carbon footprint. Now, this is a study that goes to that question of whether e-bikes, riding an e-bike actually gives you any exercise. They took, 20 volunteers, not a huge sample size, sedentary people who didn't get any exercise. They gave them free e-bikes. They asked them to ride at work at least three times a week for a month. And all of these subjects were chosen so that they had at least a 20 minute bike ride each way to work. They put sensors on them so uh, they were able to measure that while riding their heart rates were pretty pretty high comparable to a brisk walk or an easy jog so for 20 minutes they had a nice little cardio workout at the end of the month they had all kinds of statistics about how much fitter they were and they also had fun i mentioned that before most of them rode more than the minimum requirement and several participants bought e-bikes after the study ended. So let's talk about some cons. Um, Christina, you've already mentioned cost. They're expensive. Um, but they're, the less, they're less expensive than a car, which is in my situation that my, my son needed another vehicle to get to work this summer. So it's a heck of a lot cheaper than a car. Um, there's a, a really great website that I put in the tips um, called electricbikereview.com and they review and recommend e-bike models in tons of different categories and in each category there's an affordable option and the, the affordable options are like $1,500. So even an affordable e-bike, to Galen's point, you can get one for cheaper, but it's not gonna be one that anybody who knows anything about bikes is gonna recommend. Attitude. Uh, I just wanna call you out, Christina. When I asked you about your e-bike, you started to apologize for having bought one. <laughs> for having what? For having bought one. You were like, I can't remember exactly what, but you had to like defend yourself that you, you were riding an e-bike and not just riding a regular bike. Um, th this is a thing here in this country. People like uh, uh, think that e-bikes are cheating. Here's a, um, here's a screenshot of some comments that, that I found on a video. Can everyone see that? I hope the... I hate being enough. overtaken by these bikes. It's like cheating, probably what Peloton felt about Lance. Yeah. Who do you think is writing that kind of comment? It's one of these guys. This is the dominant bike culture in, in at least in Lexington. This is a photo right in front of the Ride Studio Cafe in Lexington. Um, 
you know, people are really proud of their bikes and about their, their they, they think of bikes as a, as a piece of fitness equipment, that the purpose of it is for fitness and it's a competitive thing. And, you know, if you put a motor on a bike, my goodness, that's cheating. Here's another comment. Has a motor equals motorbike. Hiding the throttle inside the cranks doesn't change the fact that they are motorized. These things are designed to skirt laws regarding motorized vehicles. Again, not only are you like cheating against the other bike riders who, who you're passing, you're like a lawbreaker and a, you know, like, like a tax evader kind of thing. Um, there, there is an attitude issue that um, I'm hoping, you know, is overcome as these things get uh, more, more common. Poor infrastructure is another con. Like, it's one thing to ride an e-bike in Amsterdam where they have unbelievable infrastructure for biking, but it's another thing to ride an e-bike around Lexington and I hope, Galen, that you're going to talk to at least mention complete streets and stuff like that about the efforts to improve um, our infrastructure for bikes. Um, you know, if you, if you don't have protected bike lanes, then riding on the street can be very stressful and not to mention dangerous. Um, so, Infrastructure is very important and we need to improve it. Weather. Christina, you want to talk to this? No, not <laughs> at all. Um, so I've ridden my bike every day this week. And, you know, for those of you who've been paying attention to the weather, it hasn't been so good. Like, it, like I said, right, I looked like I was going to my lobster boat some days. I haven't done winter. I haven't done sleeting rain. But I am a firm believer in you dress for the weather. And I haven't, because we, have, we didn't have the march that we normally did with ice, I didn't feel that as a danger. But, but traditionally, the, the, the rain and the wind for the weather hasn't been a con. I can't speak to snow and ice, but the rain, I felt okay. I, uh, I put snow tires on my bike in the wintertime and I, I ride it all winter long. And there are a couple of days where um, it's just not a good idea um, because it is too dangerous, mainly because the streets get narrower um, in the snow and um, there's just less, there's less road for everybody to share. Um, but uh, I don't know what all the participants of this webinar um, are thinking about, you know, thinking about biking on an e-bike more and driving a car less or just getting an e-bike for the fun and pleasure. My wife, for example, also owns an e-bike and she only rides it for fun. So weather's not an issue because she only rides it when the weather is fine. Um, speed, um, why did I put this in here as a con? Uh, so speed is a con in the sense that going fast is more dangerous than going slowly. Um, for example, if you hit a car door, um, at 20 miles an hour, it's, it's a lot different than hitting it at 10. Um, and maybe that's what I was thinking about for speed, or maybe I was thinking that cars are much faster. <laughs> I think if I could jump in real quick, sure. I'm so sorry, just to, to step in. I think what we see in the advocacy front is speed is a concern, not necessarily for the user on the bike, but for everybody around. Mm. You can imagine how crowded the bike path gets on a Sunday. Um, there is serious and valid concerns of uh, a bike that has capability of going up to 20 miles an hour under motor being on a crowded bike path. Now that said, ideally the user wouldn't go max speed and so I think my argument is, you know, you have a sports car, but if you enter a speed, you know, a, a school zone, you have to go to the speed limit. You have to drop down. You're not always maxing out your speed in any vehicle, frankly. But that is um, one of the major concerns about 
how we share our space with people mm. who are going to be on e-bikes. And, um, you know, there's concern of going faster. I mean, we know it on the pathway, even on analog bikes, we'll call them or regular bikes. When a, a road biker is going too fast on a bike path, it is a danger. Um, so speed is kind of a, a catch-all, I would say, for not just e-bikes, but for all of us is how we negotiate and share our, um, our narrow areas. Mm. Uh, range is a con. Hmm. I don't know what I was thinking here, only uh, as opposed to cars. Yeah, I think, uh, um, uh, so I've, I've, I've tried to ride my e-bike instead of driving as much as possible for the last three years. And the, the times that I do drive are when I have to go a long distance. So it's not like e-bikes are great, but it's, you know, it's pretty daunting to think of like riding my e-bike to Manchester, New Hampshire when I have to go up there, for example. And whereas it's a pretty easy car ride. And carrying capacity, the same thing. So uh, for example, during the pandemic, we did a lot fewer grocery shoppings. We did a lot of like pickup at the, at the grocery store of giant uh, amounts of, of shopping fewer times. Normally, I go quite often on my bike, but I didn't want to be in the grocery store. So when you have a giant amount of groceries, unless you have a cargo bike, um, it's not as convenient as having a car. So tips. Any more tips, Christina? Well, we talked about, yeah. Um no, um, I don't know that I have a lot of tips. Maybe that'll come up in the, the Q&A if people had, have questions. Um, one tip I had, again, was the um, Electric Bike Review website. Here's a shop, a shot of the website. I can't, I can't say enough about this site. Forget the guy's name, Galen. Do you know the guy who, who started it? He's amazing. He's an engineer. And he does these video reviews of every, not every bike anymore, because he's got staff now. But um, he, it's very educational hearing him talk about these bikes and about what's good about them and, and what's not about them. And the cool thing is that he has recommendations, but the ones that he thinks are, are good. Oh, another tip I was going to uh, talk about is taking a class. Now, I, as uh, Susan mentioned, I'm on the Lexington Bicycle Advisory Committee and Peggy, the chair at the time, asked everybody to take one of these bike classes. And I thought, oh, I don't need to take a bicycle class. I've been riding a bike since I can remember. And you know, that's how I got around in high school and whatnot. And I know how to ride a bike. But the class was amazing. It was fantastic. Um, there were all these videos with theory, uh, a lot about how to ride a bike safely in traffic. And um, uh, then there was a half day of sort of bicycle skills and a half day of riding where they put us through all kinds of real world on the street situation where we had to ride through rotaries and, you know, across on Trapello Road, across the highway, not Trapello Road, where is it where Home Depot is? Like that crazy Winter intersection, Street. Winter Street. I, I would never have done these things in a million years if I hadn't taken one of these classes. And, I, and if, with Cycling Savvy anyway, if you take the class, you get to do the practical as many times as you want whenever they have a class. And I went and did it again because it was just so much fun. Um, there's also the League of American Cyclists, American League of American Bicyclists that have classes, although I couldn't find one um, locally. Highly recommend one of these classes if you're thinking about biking more and driving less. Just a super quick interjection um, is some exciting news. Uh, in the fall, the town is planning to host one of those intensive uh, weekend sessions um, like a, a cycle smart program for adults 16 plus so we're so look for that and also awesome. need to have a something in the summer uh, a bike smart course for adults so we'll make sure that gets publicized when it's all set up 
Um, am I going way over here? Do we have time for Galen? Because it's almost eight o'clock. I'm sorry. Um, do, did you, do you want to, do you have just a couple more slides and then we can. This is it. This is the last okay, one. Okay, great. Then I think you're fine. Cause this was actually set for eight 30, but I'm sure people would like to finish early if they can. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, Galen mentioned speed on the bike path. I avoid the bike path, uh, as much as possible. And I only go on the bike path if it's at times when there's not a lot of people on it because, um, and when I do go on the bike path, I keep my speed way down, keep it to under 15 miles an hour. Um, but I live in fear of being a statistic, the first e-bike versus pedestrian accident on the bike path. Because, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, it, it's, the bike path is, is not a great bike path. It's, it's a great linear park, but it's not a great place to, um, to be biking along with when there's a lot of people on it. Um, I'll skip over putting stuff in your panniers. That's obvious. Have a plan B. What I found when I started biking instead of driving is that um, cars are unbelievably reliable. And uh, there are things that go wrong with bikes. I've had, I've broken a chain. Uh, I've had several flat tires and um, like if you don't always have a plan B, um, you can get stuck. So that's, that's all I have. This is uh, my last slide, which is my proposal for changing the Minuteman commuter bike path logo. Great. Well, <laughs> thank you, Omar. Appreciate that. Um, and so Galen, uh, you're going to talk to us about kind of speed and uh, the, the types of bikes, right, and, and legislation related to it. And Yeah, I'd be happy to. Can um, we go? I'll encourage folks to utilize the chat um, as well to throw in any questions. So, um, you know, we're not getting too much in there, but this is hopefully geared for what folks are interested in. And, you know, we're going to be around for another 20, 30 minutes of, of content. So please, let's make sure we're catering to what folks want to know. So just a hit to say, what's going on out there? Um, feel free to use the chat. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, I wonder if you could enable that. And then I could, I did find some slides that I'll use. Um, kind of an old presentation from um, last year, but it's still very pertinent. So let's see here. Um, I'm a co-host. Thank you, Susan. And thanks everyone for sticking with us. Um, can you see my slides? Start yes. with electric bikes. Cool. So I'll just keep it in this mode just to keep it simple. Um, not to go over the same stuff that Omar did, but I'll jump into a few highlights as to where Mass Bike stands on the issue. So we are the statewide bike advocacy organization, which focuses on legislation and policy and funding, kind of the broader picture stuff. Um, a little bit less so on the bike itself, but definitely on the process that makes bike riding possible. So a lot of what we're doing right now with e-bikes is well, one, we need to define what they are, because right now they live in this gray area between bicycles and mopeds, and there's no real definition to follow uh, what the consumer protection laws from the feds are. So we want to be able to do that. And then from that, we want to have regulations to follow. So once we know what we're talking about, then we need to be able to regulate them sensibly. Um, the trouble is, working statewide, I know this uh, intensely, is that we have 351 cities and towns, which means that they're potentially could be 351 ways to define any bike, which is bad. Because you want to make sure the bike you're riding in Lexington is the same definition as the bike you're going to be riding in Arlington and in Cambridge and all the rest. Um, added to that, Minuteman is a jurisdictional pathway. So what Lexington decides, Lexington gets. But the Charles River pathway, for instance, is a Department of Conservation and Recreation. That's a state agency. So we need to make sure that the state agencies are also speaking the same language of what these devices are, along with the municipalities, along with what's being sold at the shops. So there's a lot of convolution right now. So one of the things Mass Bike is really working on is defining what these are in Massachusetts statute so that we at least are speaking the same terms. After that's done, or maybe simultaneously, because things happen in process, um, we're also working on incentives to make bike riding easier, um, not just 
e-bikes, but all bike riding, um, and make it safer. So it's the infrastructure behind it, it's the um, enforcement around the regulations, and it's the incentivization if you're gonna be riding these as commuter. So I'll get into some of that briefly in my presentation here. Um, obviously, this, this presentation I should preface was actually used for a mass DOT presentation, so um, a little geared towards planners. But um, I'm trying to convince people why they should care about e-bikes. It's easy to convince everyone here and Christina and Omar and Susan. They're all very interested because it's happening in the town and the city um, that they're, they're riding through. But why is this a statewide concern? Well, one, Massachusetts uh, has far too much congestion. We have one of the worst traffic um, patterns in the entire country. And it's just going to come right back after COVID, unfortunately. Um, and secondly, our greenhouse gas emissions 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions in our state come from the transportation sector. One more time, 40% of all the greenhouse gases are coming from transportation. We have the power to change that. And e-bikes are part of that equation. So are electric buses, um, so are you know taking the tea, all that sort of stuff, it all plays into itself, but e-bikes really could be the next big thing. Um, also a growing industry. Sorry for my jumble of words down there. I realize that I'm in my Google mode, so it's not coming through. But the point of this slide is that e-bike sales are on the rise. And even this, this is um, two years old. This is actually from 2019. Um, so the data I have for this is only for 2018. But I was doing some research uh, prior and found out that e-bike sales have gone up 500% in the past three years. 500%. That's huge. And we all know that we're in a bike boom. We all know that bike shops can barely keep bikes in stock and e-bikes are flying off the shelves. But this is a concern because we don't really know what they are statewide. So how can we really define what they are? I also kind of want to, I love this slide. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, we call this an emerging technology. That was the reason I was brought on to give this presentation back to Matt DOT. And I was like, e-bikes have been emerging since the 1890s. Like, we, we know what these are. Like, let's figure these out. It's like really not that complicated. Let's just make sure that we're doing it. Um, but that said, you know, we're all here because we want to know more. So I'm not going to try to convince people. But I love this because this is actually a patent from Boston. Um, granted patent number 552271 for a battery powered bicycle. Um, and in 1897, Hosea Libby patented this through the Boston Patent Office. So we have a long history of riding e-bikes here in Eastern Massachusetts. Just wanna throw that out there. It's also really cool. I love being able to do this research. Um, cool. Um, what are they? So this is, this is the knowledge side that I'll throw at you. Um, we talked a little bit about this, the pedal assist versus what I call power on demand, um, or what was referred to as the oomph. Um, it's the throttle, it's the button version. There is a distinction. And the reason that distinction exists is basically because consumer protection laws under the feds say that there's two different types of motor activation. One only activates when you're pedaling. You have to be pedaling. The other one activates when you have a throttle. Both are probably fine. Both are kind of, you can get a bike that kind of is merging of both. Um, but there is a difference based off what we're able to purchase. So that's why I bring this out. And that's kind of what we're trying to align Massachusetts to say, okay, well, there's two distinctions. There's ones that really require you to pedal. So if a municipality or a jurisdiction wants to um, allow pedal assist only, they have that ability because we have a definition, although we don't yet, that's what we're working on, but that's kind of what we're up to. Um, along with those, there are, I should also say, sorry, before I leave this slide, um, along with the distinction between pedal assist and power on demand, there's also the speed designation. So there's class one, which is a slower speed pedal. There's class two, which is a throttle speed, uh, a lower speed throttle base. So they all tap out, they, the motor stops when you hit 20 miles an hour. Um, and then there's a class three, which goes up to 28 miles an hour, which arguably is fast. And the reason that you have that distinction is because if you are really able to go 28 miles an hour, you really do need a couple more checks in that. So you can break a speed limit, for instance. Um, you know, it's, it's, you might not want the faster e-bikes um, to go that fast on the on the roadways or on the I mean on the pathways, so we're at least building into our classification model ways that you can regulate based off speed and motor um, activation. 
So why is it important? Why is mass bike considering this? Well, one, they're bikers. We care about all bikers. I don't care if you're on a tricycle. I don't care if you're on an e-bike. Whatever you are, if you're riding a bike out there, I care about you. So this is why I'm out here. Um, but the reason it's really important for mass general law to get right is right now um, we have mopeds defined very clearly. And we have motorized bicycles under that defined very clearly because this was a big thing in like the 70s and the 80s. And we did some due diligence before my time to define what these are. But now that we have electric bikes, they don't really fit into that category because the motorized bicycles and the moped laws uh, are revolve around the size of the gas engine. It's a cubic centimeter of the engine, which obviously does not pertain to e-bikes. So the current law for mopeds and motorized bicycles talks about the gas nature of it. So instead of throwing the old laws out and redefining mopeds because they're still around, they're still doing their thing, we want to carve a new niche for e-bikes, which is what at this point 42 other states have done. So we are like one of, and us and seven other states are the only states still left who have yet to define e-bikes independent from mopeds. And right now it's a very gray area. Now it doesn't matter on the roads. I will say that the RMV, since this presentation was pitched, they've actually gone and fixed it. For the registry of motor vehicles, there is e-bikes. And e-bikes are allowed on the roads in their own category and it's done through the RMV because MassDOT was just able to do it on their own. But that does not translate to the bike paths of Lexington. And that does not translate to the bike paths of the DCR. So, or on trustees land or on whomever else, because RMV is good for the roads, great. We have e-bikes defined, thank you registrar, they've done it. But now we need to make sure that that is followed wholesale throughout the state. And so that's why we're trying to get this definition done. Um, it's a gray area. We haven't actually seen case studies yet, um, but mainly it's concerned citizens. So I'll get a call of somebody who wants to ride a bike path coming up from Simsbury, Connecticut on their e-bike. And they're like, I'm on an e-bike. It's defined in Connecticut state law. I'm allowed to be here. This is totally fine. But once that pathway crosses over into Westfield, Massachusetts, technically, I'm not allowed to be here. It's the same pathway. It's the same user. You're just riding it the same. But because the state law hasn't caught up, that's where the breakdown happens. And what I'm trying to prevent is people from saying, oh, I shouldn't ride in Westfield because legally it doesn't exist. That's, that's really what we're trying to avoid or a bike shop saying, you know, we are a half a block from the bike path, but technically this doesn't have a definition. And so maybe a Lexington police officer might be able to say, you're not allowed here. We don't want any of that. We want this to be very clear. We want the town to be able to say, yes, e-bikes are allowed because we know what e-bikes are. And then what Lexington says also is the same as what Arlington will say, is the same as what Bedford will say. And this is why it's kind of, it, it, in my opinion, it's like a nuance, which is just, it's, I'm making it more complicated than it needs to be because I have to make it into a law, which is a little bit of editorializing. So um, with that, um, this is a definition, I kind of went through this already, but basically what Omar was talking about too, 750 watts, top speed of 20 miles an hour. We want them to be considered bicycles and not motor vehicles. We want them to be able to have the same rights and responsibilities as bicycle riders, which we have very good laws at what a bicycle rider must do. We have very defined laws as to hand signals, lights at night, riding two abreast, being able to pass on the right at stoplights, not getting doored. All these are very bicycle user specific laws that Mass Bike has fought for decades to do. We also want them to pertain to e-bike riders too. So part of the law that we're trying to build into this is to say e-bike riders have the same rights and responsibilities as regular bicycle riders, as well as jurisdictions can then regulate where e-bikes should and shouldn't be ridden. But that does not negate the fact that an e-bike rider still has the same rights of uh, use of the roadways as a bicycle rider does, which is very important because moped riders do not. Uh, mopeds have very specific turn signals they have very specific needs. Uh, they go faster. They're not technically allowed on the side paths on bikeways. So we want to make sure that an e-bike rider is considered more aligned with a bicycle rider and less aligned with a gas-powered moped. Cool. This is a snapshot of 
Oh, please, yeah, jump in. Sorry, I just had a quick question on your last slide. It mentioned something about the weight of a person, so 170 pounds. I was just curious why that is. So, so if you're 180 pounds or, or more. Good uh, question. Um, this was put into place back in 2004, and I think based off, I'm, I'm kind of stealing a little bit from the lobbying perspective. So I was like, what documents did they really base this off of when they put this into federal law? And the argument that the, the industry had for 20 miles an hour as the maximum for the wattage, and that's, that's kind of how they combine the weight. And this is what I meant to say earlier about by limiting the wattage, you can limit essentially the weight of the device. Um, and that's an important way of saying, you know, we want to say an e-bike can go 20 miles an hour, but we don't want it to say like a 40 pound e-bike can go 20 miles an hour. So the way that we get around that is basically saying the wattage of the engine, of the motor, I should say, the wattage of the motor de facto regulates the weight. And um, they just did by arguably like a rule of thumb here of 170 pound person going a maximum speed, yada, yada, is typically 70, 50 watts. But I'm actually finding that, to be honest, 750 is probably a lot. Um, you can get away with 500 watts, no problem for most bikes. But the reason that we want 750 up there is because cargo bikes are important to, to keep in mind. Um, and you know we don't want them to go fast, we don't want them to be dangerous, but we want to be able to have these basically replace the minivan. Um, and you see these around, you see like five or six kids in a bucket bike riding on the bike path. It's like, oh, well that's great because that's one less minivan out there and it's, it's, it's totally within the realm, it should be a bicycle. So that's the kind of the, the category we're trying to catch. And I should also say that all of this is still in conversation, these are, processes that need to go through the state house, which need to go through the transportation committee. There will be opportunities for the general public to chime in. So if you're interested in weighing in um, the transportation committee, uh, pay attention to MassBike, MassBike.org, sign up for our mailing list. We'll let you know when these are actually gonna go to committee. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we've got laws we need to pass um, and there's a public process to do that. Um, this is a little bit out of date um, for the most part. New, now New York, has the three class law. Um, but besides that, we are like one of seven states of the whole union who does not define e-bike. Um, and that's a problem. That, that means that we're like well behind the curve. That said, we can kind of watch what other states are doing and say what's working and what's not working. So we actually can probably build a better law. So I'm, I'm kind of appreciative from my perspective as an advocate, I can kind of look at the mistakes of Maine. For instance, Maine built their law in 2019 that would uh, prohibit any sort of e-mountain bikes on natural surface trails based off the concerns of conservationists and, and park users and mountain bikers, which is a valid concern. But now because they built a prohibition in statute, they need to now put a new law in to say, actually, we went a little too far in 2019. We need to rewrite the law and say, it's actually up to the land manager as to whether or not e-bikes should or shouldn't be used. But because they went ahead and built the law prohibiting it, they need to now build another law, which would then change the original law that they just passed two years ago to make it a more neutral language. So we're seeing that as a, a, a cautionary tale and saying, well, in Massachusetts, let's just build the law that we want outright and not think like, oh, let's get whatever we can pass and then we'll work it later. That's not a good way to build uh, um, legislation. So we're seeing, um, for instance, I can get to it shortly, if anybody is concerned about e-mountain biking, what Mass Bike is proposing is that that comes down to the individual land managers to say what is and isn't allowed. Totally saying that mass, that e-bikes could not be allowed and they have the full right to say no, but they're not starting with a no. They're starting with a, well, let's designate whether or not a trail should or shouldn't be, which is how mountain biking access is done currently. Um, there is no blanket mountain bike access throughout the state. But then again, there's no blanket prohibition on mountain biking throughout the state either. So if you're looking at something like the Fells as a DCR park, there are certain trails that are designated for mountain biking, certain trails where they're prohibited. That's what we're proposing is done for e-mountain bikes as well. Sorry for the tangent, but it does get complicated. Um, and then here's a little bit about our um, an act relative to electric bicycles. This is the classification model that we're trying to propose, which is great because it follows the federal guidelines. Um, and we're still leaving regulations up to the local jurisdictions. So Lexington can regulate e-bikes, no question. 
we're suggesting that instead of saying class one's allowed and class two is not allowed or whatever they come to, that you actually base it off of speed and usage because there can be class three riders who are riding slowly and somebody who might have a class three bicycle because it's the model that they chose because it fits their needs or their ability level. We don't want to necessarily say all class threes are bad. Again, like I have a Maserati, but I can still go less than 20 miles an hour in a speed zone. I don't have a Maserati, but if I did have a Maserati, but that's kind of the option. Like you don't want to say, okay, a road biker who can easily go above 20 miles an hour on a bike path, you can't ride that road bike on the pathway. You can only ride your hybrid bike. That's, that's not sensible regulation. We're trying to say, you know, it really does come down to the need of the space, not necessarily the device, but it comes down to the user. But that said, the law that we're trying to pass doesn't necessarily regulate that based off the classes. It basically says these three classes are considered to be bicycles and then you can regulate still based off the user and based off the, the speed and recklessness. You can still have full regulatory powers. But what we're trying to do again is get it out of the moped category and get out of the motorized bike category. Um, I'll kind of take a pause. I think the rest of my presentation is a little bit more along the lines of what Omar was talking about. Who's riding? Why are they riding? A lot of older adults, a lot of families, a lot of cargo. Um, and then who's not riding? This is also an important one. I think I'll kind of end here by saying, I like to use this slide by saying a lot of people are in this interested but concerned category. I'd say two thirds of the population of people who are not yet riding. Um, there's like the 7%, which is kind of my category where I'm like enthused and confident and I'll generally ride. Then there's like the 1% of people who will ride in any condition, which God bless you. I'm fighting for you too. But really why I think e-bikes are important is really getting that 60% of the population. And this, this statistic isn't like a real statistic. This is like from a survey from 10 years ago out of Portland. But I like to use this as a general framework to say, why are people not riding? Mainly it's the infrastructure. And so if you have a bike lane, like a Shero or in a door zone, or that's unprotected, like we generally see, we're not gonna get a lot of ridership. It really does come down to building in good infrastructure. So it's not just good enough to say e-bikes are great. Everybody rides an e-bike. We want to say, okay, you, you really need to have safe places to ride. And um, um, I'll put it where I want to go with this. I'll kind of leave it with this. Um, this is a snapshot of the mass trails network, of the landline network, the uh, trail network. You can kind of see it's a little hard, but my cursor we kind of get in the greater Boston area. We have a lot of these wiggled lines, which, you know, we've got the Minuteman that goes out here that can connect up. Where's the Minuteman? I'm trying to find it. Um, I'm going to guess based off my, yep, Minuteman can come out here. And then you have like the reformatory path um, that comes down through Bedford. Then you might have the, the Bedford narrow gauge um, that will connect eventually to the Mass Central Rail Trail through Weston and Wayland, which will connect out to the Norwatic Rail Trail, which we're connected to the Farmington Rail Trail, and we're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles of interconnected pathways. Um, part of this is the East Coast Greenway, which is all the way from Maine down to Key West, Florida. It's like 70% of the way done of off-street trails, a lot of which go through Massachusetts. The ideal that we're trying to build to is what we're trying to get here on the, on the right. This is Ambassador Street by MIT in Cambridge. Off-street pathways, protected infrastructure, that's the real way to get the people who are interested but concerned. And then e-bikes, you know, are a way to say to Omar's point of riding farther, riding over hills, riding if you're going to commute and don't want to get sweaty. But the idea of having, if we really do build out our trails network, my vision is really to have this like interconnected super highway of bicycle commuters, of which a big proponent and component and proof of pudding is the Minuteman. And the Minuteman is one of the best used commuter pathways in the entire country. And what we're seeing is the Minuteman is the gold standard that we're trying to get others to follow, knowing that the Minuteman itself is probably too narrow for all the uses that are on it. Um, and so how can we actually look, what's Minuteman 2.0? Um, Minuteman might need lighting. Minuteman definitely needs plowing. The Minuteman might need some widening. Because what we're really trying to get at, and again, maybe I'll go back to my original slide of why do we care about this, 
we, we have to fix our congestion problem. We're never going to build more roads in this Commonwealth. We need to we need to find other ways of getting people around. And our biggest existential crisis right now is, is climate change. So what are we going to do? We need to promote e-bikes. So my last last hit, I'll stop sharing, and I got one more thing to talk about um, legislation-wise. This uh, of the three bills that we are promoting, um, we have the definition bill, which is an act um, relative to electric bicycles. Then we have an act relative to bike commuting, which would give you, if you are a commuter, um, the ability to have your employer give you pre-tax monies to pay for your bike repairs, your bike share passes, your e-bikes. I think it's up to $750 per year that can come pre-tax, similar to your parking benefit and your MBTA benefit. And then one of the ones I'm really excited about, um, props to Rep Blaze out in um, the hill, hill towns of the Berkshire East area. She's really big on e-bikes because they do not have good transit and they have a lot of hills and they have a lot of rural communities that are far apart. So she's got this an act relative to bicycle rebate. It's H 3262. What this bill would do, it would give rebates either at point of sale or reimbursed from the state as part of the electric vehicle program. And it's up to, if the bill goes through, it's up to $500 back on your e-bike purchase, or up to 750, or if you're a low or moderate income purchaser, or up to 40%, which is amazing. And imagine the equity conversation. Imagine let's normalize e-bikes and make it more accessible and more affordable for people to ditch their car because we know that the car and car ownership is a ball and chain for poverty. Let's get people out of that mentality by actually helping them pay for e-bikes. And this is similar to the electric vehicle conversation, an electric vehicle conversation right now under the EV rebate program, which is under the EEA, which the state already has. It's geared towards lowering greenhouse emissions. E-bikes are that exact benefit, just the same. So I'm gonna ask everybody here, to contact your local state rep and say, hey, I'm a big fan of H3262, and Rep Blaze is a champion of this bill. And hey, bike shops like Omar's, it's great because you're gonna sell more bikes because people are gonna be able to afford them. And this is just a win, win, win. Like nobody loses with this bill. Less cars on the road, fewer cars on the road, less congestion. More people riding e-bikes, better for the environment, better for health, better for equity, because they're more affordable, so more moderate and low-income people can ride them. And by the way, e-bikes are great and they're fun, and so it just brings more people into the cycling community. And so little things like this is what Mass Bike's job is. We try to find little nuances to work our angles. Again, we do legislation, we do policy work, we do the funding. And you know, my benefit of being able to address you here is to say, please help us out. Um, you can always go to massbike.org. We are a member-driven organization. If you are not a Mass Bike member, or if you're unsure about it, please become one. Um, we're not, we don't even have a low uh, level, just like if you donate to us, you are considered to be a member. Sign up for our newsletter, get our action alerts, um, and then also follow along because we're going to partner with the, the town of Lexington um, a lot this season to run classes and clinics. Um, and I know I've just talked a lot and spread a lot of information at you. so. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over and see Christina, Susan, Omar, is there anything else to add? Um, yeah. and, um, and thanks. Questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, we want to make sure that um, there's time for um, everyone's questions. So we did have one uh, and it was just answered in the chat, but maybe others want to share. How much time does it take to charge an e-bike? And can you bring the battery indoors to charge it? Or do you need to bring the whole bike to an outlet? So, um, and Chris, Oh, Christina. Oh, you know, Christina, I think you answered just to me. Do you want to share your answer verbally? Um, un unmute yourself. It's a rite of passage during one of these webinars. You, you have to unmute somebody. So that was mine. Check the box. I will say that I can remove the battery but I bring my bike inside. I charge it overnight. I got my bike a little under two months ago and I've charged it once, maybe twice, but I only go four miles a day. If that answers the question. 
And Omar, do you have anything else you want to add on that one? Uh, the answer is always going to be, it depends on how discharged the battery is, right? And, and also how big the battery is. Um, different bikes have different battery capacities. Um, and uh, my, my bikes, um, I think if they were fully discharged, it would take like three, three hours or so to, uh, to charge them all the way back up, three to four hours. Um, I let them get down to like 30%. And I don't charge them all the way either because they're lithium ion batteries and they don't like to be fully charged. If they're stored fully charged for too long, it, um, it eventually will decrease the battery life, just like a um, laptop or a cell phone. Great. Thank you. Um, and See, we have another, are there any locations nearby where you can rent an e-bike to try it? Um, oh, there's gotta be. The line bikes, <laughs> <laughs> which that's how I tried it. It was a lot of fun. Um, Galen, do you have an answer for that one? Sorry, I didn't see it. Let me just pop the chat. Um, oh, it was um, any place to rent. Oh, them. rent an e-bike. Um, Good question. Um, I don't know. I'm a, I've, I'm, I've been a couple years out of the industry, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, well, it's the wrong it's the wrong thing for me to say, but like I've got a parking lot behind where I work, so like if you want to come and ride my bike, bring your own helmet, and you know try it around the parking lot. Mm -hmm. I'm at the Arts Center downtown, so 1403 Mass Ave. You can just let me know if you want to try mine around the parking lot. There you go. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a quick Google and see if I can find something in the next 10 minutes. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's a company in Boston that does tours and they do bike rentals and they e-bikes are an option. Yeah, I think I found Urban Event Tours. I'll throw this chat. Um, I'll throw this in the chat. Um, and um, I'm not advocating one way or another if you should rent from them, but they are a option for you. And they're out in the north end. Oh, I just sent it to panelists. Let me send this to everybody. Thank you. Panelists and attendees. So, so battle, battle Road Bikes, which will be at 145 Mass Ave, Lexington, will rent e-bikes when it, it opens up, but it's not open yet. So. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say legislation-wise, just because I'm on that kick, the National Park Service has allowed e-bikes um, to be considered bicycles. So that matters to you in Lexington because you have a big old national park. Um, so you can't ride recklessly, you can't ride dangerously, you're still under the same limitations of being a safe bicycle rider. But um, because NPS is its own jurisdiction, um, riding on Battle Road on an e-bike is actually defined, whereas riding on an ECR trail is still the gray area we're trying to fix. But um, national parks, Bureau of Land Management, and Army Corps have um, basically adopted the three class model for electric bicycles. I have a question. Is there anything special you do related to the maintenance hmm. that's different than a regular bike? So we learn, you know, we always do the, you know, ABCs of, of bike maintenance, you know, air brakes, chain. What, are there different ABCs? I mean, obviously you want air in your tires. <laughs> you want to check your brakes, but is there anything different that you do well, yeah, you got to charge the battery. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I, um, I've had e-bikes for three years, and I've never had to service any of the parts that are, you know, not regular bike parts. Tires had to service, the chain, you know, but, but never had to service uh, any of the electric bike components. How about you, yeah. Christina? There are new bike tires that are out too that, that don't go flat, right? Yeah, and you can also put that goop inside uh, that will stop it. That's what I did on the Pedigo. I got a lot of flats on the Pedigo. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> how about weight? I'm just curious how the weight compa generally compares of these versus a standard bike. 
So mine is probably one of the bottom of the line um, in terms of affordability, but it has a little button so that you can, um, it goes into walk mode and it assists you walking it up the hill, which is getting out of my garage. Um, so it is heavier. Like if, if you wanna move it or if you forget to charge it and you need to go on your own power, it's heavier. Yeah, they're, they tend to be heavier than regular bikes. Um, the batteries are quite heavy. The motors are heavy, um, not that heavy, but um, also, as I said before, they tend to have very beefy uh, components, like all the, all the frames and whatnot tend to be beefier um, on, on e-bikes because they're expected to be you know, punished a little more by going, going fast. Thank you. Um, anyone in the audience have any questions? And sorry, but unfortunately our uh, version here of Zoom does not have the raised hand, so I've allowed you all to talk. <laughs> so please feel free to either unmute yourself or pop something in the chat. And if there's nothing, I will just also go around, uh, maybe have Christina and Omar maybe end with what is the, your absolute favorite thing about your, your e-bike, if you had to pick one. Um, I've, well, one of the things I haven't said is that for my birthday, I went out and I got a little bell, so it goes ding, 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 which is really fun. But I also bought a mirror because I feel much more comfortable. Be I think because in the speed, you, in the same way that with a car that you want to check your rear view mirror, not, you, you know, you look and when I'm ready to turn, but just being aware of what's behind me is useful. But I like, um, I find myself giggling when I go up the hills and I can, sitting down. So I like that. Be honest, Christina, don't you look at yourself in the mirror? No? <laughs> I would fall off my bike if I tried to do that. Well, I, I wanna echo what Christina said earlier about just the, um, the mental health benefit of riding an e-bike. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a good day when I get to ride my bike to the grocery store, which is crazy, um, or to a meeting or what have you. It just, it just makes it a good day, so. Great, well, thank you. I think that's it. I, I don't see any further questions in the chat. Uh, we will, um, thank you to Lex Media for recording this. We will um, make sure this link is available. Oh, Galen, yes, go right ahead. I do see a question that came in just a second ago. Uh, the name of Omar's store, or soon to be store. Oh. It will be called Battle Road Bikes. It will open hopefully before the end of May. Great, and we're talking about, I, the address was in East Lexington near Wicked Bagels. Yes, 145 Mass Ave. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's right along the um, bike path for, for those yes. who um, aren't familiar with that area. Right, Bow Street. Right, right on the corner. Oh, there is something I want to say. We do have some other great programs coming up. Um, so check out the website lexbikewalkbus.org because we like all those modes. And some of the things we have coming up are um, actual practice sessions in person where you can practice putting your bike on a bus bike rack. Because if you can combine the two modes, if you have to go you know, far, you, maybe you work in Charlestown or somewhere like that, it's a great way to um, get yourself comfortable with whether or not you um, feel comfortable putting your bike on a bike bus rack. So we have a couple of those sessions coming up. We also have a bike flat tire clinic that will be in person, but it'll be small, COVID safe, outdoors by resident um, Lexingtonian and bike mechanic, Jim Hadenhead. And, um, and then, oh, the one thing I'm really excited about, and we're doing this with Galen, um, and, and then a Lexington resident, we're having an info session on how to become a certified bike instructor. We would love to see more certified bike instructors in our community, because um, as Omar had mentioned earlier, those cycling classes can be really great and help build our confidence in riding. So, um, so take a look at that, lexbikewalkbus.org. And thank you so much for everyone's time and we'll get back to you with a link for this program. Thank you.